G'day mate, 40 here. So I watched to the end of the uh, latest Steve Saylor interview, this one done by Patrick Casey. And uh, I don't think I've yet seen a Steve Saylor interview that breaks any ground. He just says the same things that he says on the blog and no interviewer has been able to elicit anything new or unexpected or particularly interesting or compelling from him. Now, obviously, I think that I could, but uh, I have uh, struck out in all my Steve Saylor interview requests since 2007. I think I did one in 2007 uh, for my blog. It was just uh, written questions. But I'm just struck that all the Steve Saylor interviews I listen to, every single one, they, they don't move the needle one iota. There's nothing new. It would require homework, preparation, and uh, some some serious skills to uh, move move Steve Saylor into you know, territory that he hasn't tried over thoroughly on his on his blog. Uh, other thing that's interesting about the interview is that everyone's reaction to it is primarily based on Steve does his video interviews in his closet, and I think he works out of his closet too. And it just is so weird that uh, people can't get over that to focus on what he's saying. And so if you have a visual distraction that's sufficient enough, people can have a hard time listening to what you're saying. Now, if Steve Saylor was doing a Twitter space, or, or just purely an audio-only podcast, then this wouldn't come up. But uh, pretty much everyone is just so thrown by the fact that this is a, an approximately, what, 60, 65-year-old man who is working out of a closet. Now, Ricardo says, what about Kyle? He worked out at McDonald's and you know, Kyle worked, at, worked out of all sorts of places, but Kyle's like 22, 23, 24, 25. I, it's entirely, one has an entirely different reaction. And he's a green screen, but just a different location. So. We expect different things from people who are 20, 25, than we do people who are 65. And so it's not weird when Kyle has to live stream from a McDonald's or the equivalent, or if he has to stream from his closet or someone else's closet, right? People in their 20s, you don't expect them to have the same kind of security and uh, set up that you, you do for people in their 50s and 60s. Yeah, so Steve does, you know, apparently own the home that he's broadcasting from, but it just strikes most people as weird and so it overwhelms his message. And we expect different things from different people depending on what, what age they are. Uh, Steve, uh, Dennis Prager noted that when he goes on TV, people's primary reaction to him is based on how he looks, you know, what, what kind of suit, what kind of tie, uh, what he looks like visually, while uh, on the radio, people primarily react according to what he says. So, Dennis Prager says this shows that the eye is the most superficial organ, uh, but it's true. When you, I've gone on TV uh, many times, you know, at least a dozen times I've been on TV, and uh, yeah, people's primary reaction is to what I look like, like what's going on with my hair, what's going on with my eye contact, you know, how loose, comfortable or tense I am in my body. So yeah, the reactions are primarily based on what I look like rather than what I have to say. Well, if I do radio or an audio only podcast, then people are primarily reacting to the ideas or the anecdotes that I, I relay. See, Sailor seems very even keel, doesn't he? So he's the opposite of like an Andrew Sullivan, who's just incredibly enthusiastic and scattered. But uh, I just don't recall Steve Sailor losing his temper. Uh, I don't recall him getting swept away by enthusiasms. Uh, he seems like a you know, pretty good role model for the a disinterested analyst 
scientist, observer type personality. Now, excitable, enthusiastic people are very compelling uh, to watch or even to read, but obviously the not you know the ideal type of personality for a disinterested you know, objective perspective on things so barack obama he gave off kind of a cool objective you know, calm temperament personality so john mccain remember during the 2008 presidential election john mccain wanted to uh, cancel his campaign to focus on the wall street bailout bill and uh, Barack Obama had a good rejoinder. He said, I, you know, I think we can do both things at once. So McCain cancelled his campaign, said we're going to you know, meet in Washington to try to hash things out. But uh, when John McCain showed up in Washington, he had no plans. Okay. He had no plan on how to deal with the very thing that he said he was cancelling his campaign over. So I'd be interested in asking uh, Steve Saylor what effect he notices that reading him has on other people. So Saylor is very much like Charles Murray. They're two people who seriously wish America well, would like America to deal with its crime problem and other problems in you know, a rational, effective manner. And they're not sitting back on the sidelines like uh, distant types such as Jean-Francois Garapi, who just expect all of Western civilization to go up in flames, and then they will be called upon to you know, lead the, the rebirth of civilization. And I think that's a, I think that's a useful, adaptive, pro-social perspective. I, I just can't imagine anyone with you know, close ties to family, friends, community, just being A-OK -okay with Western civilization going up in flames and just sitting on the sidelines, you know, waiting to take over when everything else burns down. But, you know, Sailor is still, for all his, his distant views, he's still very much embedded in, in America. And he made the point to Patrick Casey, there's no viable way for the United States to break up and to fragment into different polities, different kingdoms. And that if there was such a breakup, that uh, he would regard it the same way that Vladimir Putin regarded the breakup of the Soviet Union as the, you know, the greatest tragedy ever. And there is no way for the United States to just simply break up into you know, red states and blue states. And I don't think it's necessary. I think it's uh, you know, a fantasy. So what type of people have apocalyptic fantasies like this about American Civil War and American breakup. Well, there was a good article on loneliness in the New York Times today. Long article. But it makes the point that when we're lonely, that's like an alarm system going off in our central nervous system that we need more human connection. And then if we don't meet that need, we walk around in an alarmed state. So we react to threat or possible threat or illusions of threat much more quickly and much more severely than if we're connected. And so I think this accounts for the high threat activation of most people in distant political circles because marginalized movements attract marginalized people who are marginalized people, people who lack human connection people who lack human connection are walking around in a permanent alarm state. They're very quick to see threats or to invent threats to give you know, themselves an adrenaline shot or meaning or purpose. And so if you don't have human connection, right, you can't bond with other people, you have to bond with something. And so people who are disconnected and lonely, they, they bond with the sense of danger and doom. And so I think the reason that so many people in distant circles feel absolutely doomed about the future of America, future of France, future of the United Kingdom, has nothing really to do with America, France, and the United Kingdom. Everything to do with themselves, their own disconnection, and their own lack of ties to family, friends, community, profession, educational institution, uh, volunteer opportunities. 
And so when you're disconnected, you're in a permanent state of alarm. You're looking for disaster everywhere. You expect the worst. And so you often trigger the worst things happening to you because what we, what we think about, what we fantasize about, what we become afraid of, right? We, we are generally more predisposed to bring about. And so you know, people like uh, Dennis Dale, you know, whatever happens in the world, it reinforces his fatalism that we're absolutely doomed. And so when you're in that lonely, disconnected state, you know, pretty much every stimuli you receive, you'll experience and filter through this prism of, you know, we are doomed, disaster is just around the corner, headed for a fiery apocalyptic end. And it distorts one's sense of reality. The most effective prism for approaching reality is coming from a place of love and gratitude for the love relationships and family connections and opportunities and kindness that you have in your life right so when you come from a place of love and gratitude right you don't have this hyperbolic fear response threat response you're not yearning for some kind of fiery apocalypse so i had a little bit of pyromania when i was a kid about age seven there were a couple of times that i deliberately lit, lit fires outside my house and i understand it now is that i was you know, such an unhappy kid I wanted the outside world to burn up in flames to kind of match the inside world and I think we all kind of want the outside world to match our inside world so if we're happy we want everyone else to be happy and we want society to function and for people to prosper if you're happy you're naturally inclined to be helpful to other people and to get along with other people and naturally inclined towards pro-social behavior and language and and habits and patterns and you, know, you want to build things up when you're miserable, right, you want everyone else to be miserable. You want to tear down everything around you. You almost can't help it through force of will. It's just your misery just drives you in a not just self-destructive, but socially destructive, antisocial, uh, maladaptive direction. So when I hear people talk about the world outside or talk about politics, often I feel like I'm primarily getting a sense of what's really going on with them. So if they feel that the world around them is doomed, largely it comes from a place of, you know, they think they are doomed. If uh, they see a lot of hope and opportunity in the world around them, because they have a lot of hope and opportunity for themselves, if they're at ease with themselves, they tend to be, you know, at ease with reality and what, what's going on around them. So there's a famous saying, we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are.